I'd like to talk today a little bit about the nature of our God, not just about his person. If you watch our videos and specifically mine, you'll see a lot of times I really like to talk about the person of God as in how we are made in his likeness. And today I want to talk a little bit about the personality, the character of our God, because I spent a lot of years in religion and what I see going on in religion saddens me because although we identify him as a person through this man, Jesus Christ, the man that God became, when I look at the way we deal with each other, human to human, we deal with each other differently. It seems we deal with each other in a, in a kinder way, in a nicer way, in a way that maybe well, if we treated each other like we treat God, we probably wouldn't appreciate it a lot because we do kind of treat him as a benefactor, as someone who can do things for us. And I know there's nothing new. You might say, well, big deal, Mark, of course, that's God. That's what he's there for. But is he really? Is he really there to provide things for you? And what I ask in this study is to consider that he's already given you everything and that says so much about his nature and about his character. And even though we treat him as a, a big gumball machine in the sky, he still loves us and he still, he's still guiding us towards the day where we might see him for who he is. He doesn't cast us away. That says so much about his character that he would be so long suffering and patient, obviously more than any of us would. Because if, if you or I were rich and all our friends wanted to do was treat us special so they could get something out of us, we probably wouldn't be very patient with it. And that's why probably a lot of rich people get secluded. Or maybe they stroke their own egos about it and they enjoy having all that attention lavished on them. And we believe that about our God too. So you're taught always to praise him to basically treat him like this rich man, praise him and lavish him with all of this praise. And, uh, and there's a word in the Bible that's uh, almost a dirty word, it's flattery. But that's basically what you're told to do. You're told to flatter your father so he'll be kind to you. So that he'll be kind to you. Think of that phrase, so that he'll be kind to you. Your father needs prompting to be kind to you. That, uh, I've been getting, my wife and I have been getting to know our God in the last year and that very notion is heartbreaking to me to think that that's the message he gets from us because we kind of know how great his love is for us and we don't need to seek to get anything from him because he gives himself to us every single day. And we didn't know it for many years. We're not pointing the finger at anyone. We just hope that you would consider that there's so much more to God than stuff even in physical healings, because folks, this is all going away. You're gonna die. You're gonna die, no matter how many times you get healed, no matter how great the healing. But there's something he wants for you right now. And it has to do with that character. It has to do with that heart. It has to do with the person of who your God is. Not just that he's an individual, but he is a very tender, loving, and caring individual. And he is patient. And he's working on you. It may not seem like it. It may not seem like it to you regarding the people you love. I know I feel that way sometimes. But it took him a long time to get me to open my eyes. So again, I say, just consider this. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. And just on the notion of being rich and that even being something one should want. Which uh, I don't think, if you've been in church buildings, I don't think it would be a shocker to you that a lot of people pray for for financial wealth. They ask for it openly. You know, it may seem crass to you and where you're at, but it's not uncommon at all. And it's not even considered ungodly by a lot of people's standards. And there's an old proverb and it says, wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. That's what we're talking about is choice between that and the heart of God. And I understand when we're when we're new and we you know we we're taught all this stuff that God is a jackpot, so to speak, and get a lot of things out of him. It's understandable to uh, 
I'm going to replay that song again because I just like it so much. It was short. We're on long-winded today. But he has so much to offer. There's so much more than that. So here's a couple of scriptures I'm going to read to you. In Matthew 11, 29, Jesus speaking, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Uh, if you believe like I do, and I hope you do, if not, consider this as well, that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the man that God became. And God just said here, he is meek and lowly in heart. You know how many times God is described as a rich man in the Bible? And never. <laughs> it says he, has, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but he's not talking about that to say he's rich. He's talking about that to show how giving he is. Nothing he has is of any value to him except that and he can share it with you. And so I won't even deny that he might, in fact, try to get his children through blessing them with these carnal things or with these material things because he'll do anything to get you. It's just that there's so much more he has for you. Going to the heart of who our God is and the tenderness and the kindness. This is Zechariah 9.9 in the, the World English Bible. says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is righteous and having salvation. That's all normal, right? Then, lowly and riding on a don donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that last part, I never used to understand the emphasis there, because it's one thing to ride on a donkey, but he's not even riding on a full-grown donkey. He's riding on a colt, the foal, or the child, the son of a donkey. That's your God. He's bringing salvation, he's righteous, and he's lowly. That's not just the man. That man displayed and illustrated and revealed the nature of our God, your Father. Your Father is lowly. And it's it's all because that's who He is. Because that's He knows the only way He's going to get to you is by coming down here to be with you. Because He wants to be with you forever. That's the thing you got to understand. He doesn't just want to get you into heaven. He wants to be with you. Yes, he wants to save you. And it's the, the salvation is just the beginning of it. He wants so much for you to know his heart and to have you show yours to him. That's what he wants. He can just see everything that's right, that's true. He is the all-knowing God. But he wants you to willingly show your heart to him and to share your two hearts together. That's the nature, the heart of the character of your God, the one we worship, the one that we ostensibly worship anyway in church buildings. One more Old Testament. It is the Lord's blessing that makes a person rich and hard work adds nothing to it. That's Proverbs 10, 22. It is the Lord's blessing that makes a person rich. And I know people can manipulate these scriptures. They obviously do. There's all kinds of prosperity teachings out there. But it clearly says the Lord's blessing that makes you rich. You may say, well, the Lord's blessing is two cars in my garage and uh, an executive position in my company. You can do that if you want, but that's not the Lord's blessing. The Lord's blessing is the things I've been talking about here. It's his heart. It's his great love for you. That's the thing that's, the thing that's gonna last forever, is you and him together forever. It's not your two car garage or your raise or your promotion or your happy family or any of it. It's the heart of your God, that's the blessing. That's why he ended it with, and hard work will add nothing to it. In the King James, it says sorrow. But now, um, I'm going to go back to the New Testament. And it says, but God, being rich in mercy. That's what he's rich in. Of significance, of substance. You know, it's mercy. Mercy is going to be here when all the cattle and all the riches and all the wealth is gone. God, being rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We were dead. Sin killed us. And he made us alive in Christ, in that man. That's how he did it. Our God did this 
through the richness of his mercy. And that second part, for his great love with which he loved us. And the King James says, for his great love wherewith he loved us. But that's an amazing use of the word love. Love is something that's two things. It's a verb and it's a noun. In other words, he gives us his love with his love. His love is action. It's not just a feeling like he just looks at us and goes, wow, I sure love them. No, he acts out that love. He performs that love. He proves that love by coming and doing what? By dying for us to take away our sins. He wants to be with you. He's rich. He's rich in mercy. So what are the riches of God? It's all those good things of the spirit that you already have. It's already been given to you. You're already rich. You don't need to seek it. You don't need to beg for it. You don't need to praise for it. I say, I'm not against praying for things. If you're sick, if you have a loved one that's out there dying or ill or whatever. Yeah, that's fine. It's wonderful. Just understand that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is his heart, is connecting to his heart. That's what he wants. And once you understand that, that's what you're going to want more than anything. I don't like being sick either. Trust me. I don't like it. It's just that now I know my God loves me. And it's so much different now when I go through hard times. It's totally different because I'm not alone. I am loved. And that's one thing that never changes. My health is going to change. My finances are going to change. My physical existence is going to come to an end. But one thing that's never going to change is... The connection my father's heart has with my heart. And in, uh, speaking about the riches, there's another scripture. It says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. The depths of the riches of God are wisdom and knowledge. And knowledge is intimacy. It's true intimacy. Like I said earlier, I believe that, you know, he wants your heart and he might give you these little rewards, these carnal rewards, if that's the way you identify him with, to get closer to you so that you can see the real substance of who he is, of how much he loves you. I don't say he would never do that. I'm just saying that once you have what he really wants for you, it's not going to matter. I, I don't worry about it. I'm rich. I, I believe I'm rich in the material sense too because I don't want for anything but a lot of people would look at my and my wife's life and they'd say well you guys are a train wreck or you you're just so poor you know we always like to joke about our tax man said you know you're so poor you don't even have to get Obamacare we don't <laughs> we can't be forced to do anything because we're just poverty stricken in the eyes of the world but we have great riches because we have the riches that's available to every single human being on this earth by the richest one in the universe the one who's rich in love. The only the only commodity that matters to anything or anyone eventually. Or ultimately, I should say. And I'm just going to go to this last one. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And this is in the Young's Living Translation. Or literal translation, excuse me. It says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that because of you he became poor, being rich, that ye might buy that poverty. That that ye by that poverty may become rich. Now again, I know people will, will use this and say, see, the great king, he became poor so you can become rich. And they're talking totally carnal material wealth. And that's not what it is. And I got a, a greater understanding of the scripture, I think, after all these years. Because I used to kind of take it that way. Even though I never bought into the prosperity thing, I thought, well... Yeah, he was rich. He was in heaven. He's the king. He had everything and he became poor. He came down and became a peasant. No. Think about this. Really think about this. He had everything. He had everything. The things I'm talking about. He had the adulation. He had the praise of the angels. He had it all. Not material things. Not the things that we count rich. And he gave it up. Because think, think about the reality of when he was being spat on, when he was alone at that cross with virtually no one by him, except his mockers and his scorners and his tormentors. That's what he did. He gave up everything. He was, he was no longer loved. He had to live in this world as an abandoned person. More abandoned than anyone has ever been. So he knows what you've been through. He knows what it feels like. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, but without sin. See how good that God is? 
he was rich and everything and he gave up he had to sit there uh, or hang there on that cross and say why have you forsaken me why have you forsaken me he was all alone in the world so that you could become rich in that love that was a process that was required for you to gain the riches of heaven which is not milk and honey and streets of paved with gold it's love it's the creator it's the heart it's the mind it's the recognition of knowing the revelation of who your god is that he loves you and your riches are all in him he's not a rich man that you need to get things from he's not someone you need to make sure you're faithful to a building and and your religious activities and your tithes and your offerings and you're running the youth camp or whatever it is that they tell you you need to do to be or to get blessed he's already given it all to you that's what the rich man did the rich man and god the one who is rich in love he already gave it to you and, and all you need to do is open your heart to it and receive it the floodgates are open and you can receive it all right now and be free and be at peace and have things the treasures that you just you'll never want things like that again like you used to it's not that you won't want comforts but they their their value goes down in the right perspective you see it's all temporary because you all get tired of it anyway we all do the new car all that stuff even the family all of it has its temporary nature but that love of God, the thing that he is rich in, that mercy, that grace, he was full of grace and truth. That's who your God is. That's what he's rich with. Don't seek to, to get him to give you something. Seek to receive what he's already given you. That's what it's all about. It's not about going and attending the proper meetings in the proper uniform or in the proper denomination so that you can persuade him. Paul said, do I persuade God? No, he's already persuaded because he loves you and he just wants you to have what he gave you. Open your eyes and your heart and your mind and receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.